morning, good morning. We just thank God for you uh, today, for this is the day that the Lord hath made. We have decided to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank God for your presence on today. We thank God for his presence on today for another exciting Sunday School lesson. Uh, this lesson is the first unit in a series of lessons that we're going to be exploring in the book of Ephesians, uh, beginning in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 14. Uh, before we get started, we just thank God for allowing us this privilege and this opportunity coming to us from our pastor, allowing me this present time to share with you uh, this Sunday School lesson, which is entitled, uh, Chosen in Christ. Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you for this day. It is a day that you have ordained. It is a day, O oh God, that you have brought forth in which we are going to decide to rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for each and every blessing that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you for watching over us, your angels encamping round about us. Father, you have given us life. You've given us health and strength. You've given us the use and activities of our mind, body, soul, and spirit. Your word declares that it all belongs to you. Father, we give it to you, O oh God, to use as you will. We pray, Father God, that you would use us on this morning, this day, that you speak through us, through your word, as we explore the text on today, that it would be a benefit, that it would be a blessing to those who, he who hear. Father God, we just pray, God, that you would word my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As I first stated, our lesson text today begins in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter number one. I'm going to read through the text, as well as our golden text to begin with, to give you a for those who don't have a Sunday school book, uh, it begins with uh, Ephesians chapter one, verse number three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, in whom we have redemption, again, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to his grace grace wherein we have abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath pur purposed within himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit, of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Our golden text this morning comes to us from this key verse, uh, verse number five, as well as verse number six. God is, or God predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. As I begin this particular exploration of the study, uh, Paul the Apostle is our author uh, of this particular epistle. A uh, little bit of background, Paul uh, wrote this letter to a body of believers called the Saints of the Elect in the church in Ephesus. Paul, on his second or third missionary journey throughout Asia, uh, visited the Ephesians, and he began to establish, and he also founded the church in Ephesus. 
It was also during this period of time when uh, Paul was preaching. Uh, it was a great city. It was a metropolis. It was a commercial city. It was on the port of, uh, it was a very influential uh, place of commerce. And they worshiped the great idol god of Diana. A Roman name was given Diana. Uh, the Ephesian name was Artemis. She was a goddess uh, of, of, of life, and uh, they worshipped her. Matter of fact, they made a lot of money. They, were, they, they made a lot of wealth. It was an industry where um, one named Demetrius, he was a silversmith. He had a supply chain of other, the, other uh, though there were others who had made a great amount of money of making trinkets, idols, a lot of different tokens in the image of this great goddess, Diana. When Paul came along and he began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, it created a great uproar because he preached the fact that what they were serving was not a god at all. Matter of fact, um, it was just something that could not respond to uh, anything that would cause them to um, have this type of confidence that it was a, a true deity. Uh, so he began to preach about God being the one and only true and living God. Many of them turned uh, from idol worship and became believers. Uh, it, the city was composed of Jews as well as Gentiles or Greeks, and many had turned and many had, uh, they began to have a discussion amongst themselves of, we need to stop this man because he's not only preaching uh, this gospel here in Ephesus, but he's going throughout all Asia, of which they were actually receiving um, the benefit of their trade, a global economy, as you would imagine. So we need to do something about that. So they uh, went to find who Paul was, and the uproar was so great, it was so, uh, began a riot. Paul left uh, Ephesus uh, after being there for a period of about three years, um, and then on his final journey to Jerusalem on his way to Rome, uh, Paul gathered the Ephesian elders together and began to minister to them to let them know uh, how to be encouraged. Uh, it was going to be the last time that they would see him, and it was going to be the last time that he would see them, but he encouraged them to continue in the faith. And so under that type of persecution uh, that, was, that was happening, uh, here he is writing this letter to the Ephesians. Uh, it is a very, in some way, complex uh, introduction, uh, a complicated uh, letter, because the first part of this letter uh, encapsulated six chapters of the book of Ephesus, and then it, beginning in the first three chapters, it was doctrinal, it's theological, and the second uh, half of the book, uh, chapters four through six, had to do with the practicality of how do we live out this life of holiness? How do we live out this life in a practical way where it would be pleasing to uh, God and how we are to interact with each other uh, being in the body of Christ? So these first few verses uh, will take a little bit of exploration. It did, a, uh, did me a great benefit to do a little bit of exploration on my part to just get an idea of what um, some of the principles that Paul was trying to get across, uh, the idea of, of being chosen, the idea of being foreordained, of being predestined, uh, the idea of what theology calls election, uh, the idea of being uh, predestination, those types of concepts. And so um, God's choosing is nothing new. Uh, we see uh, the best example that I could come up with is how he called Abram, uh, who we know as Abraham, out of the, uh, his kindred in Ur. And he called him to a land which Abraham knew not. And because of the fact that God had called him, Abram believed God. And because he believed God, it was counted unto him for him in righteousness. As Abraham was on his way, uh, he ran into some difficulty, and um, he encountered a, a war in which uh, five kings had come, and they had uh, taken some, uh, some of his provisions, some of his lands, uh, some of his uh, 
kinfolk, and God, through God's prevention and through God's help, Abraham was able to subdue his enemies. In chapter 15 in Genesis, very exciting thing happened uh, that parallels some of the things that we're talking about today. And that's where God appeared to Abram and let Abraham know that God was going to bless him, that God was going to uh, give him a son. At this time, Abram was asleep, so the Lord appeared to him in a vision. So when God appeared to him, he called him Abraham, and he told him, Abram, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to cause thy seed to be um, a blessing for all nations. Abraham questioned God, how can this be, knowing that I have not an heir, all I have is this servant called Elizer. And God let him know, no, that is not your heir, but I'm going to give you an heir. Your heir is going to be come out of your own bowels, and he is going to be the one I'm going to bless you. This promise that God has given him was going to be his only son. In the process of time, we see later on that um, Abraham, it took 25 years for this process to take place. But Abraham had a question, how do I know? How am I going to know that this heir that you're going to give me is going to happen? And so God caused Abraham to go into a deep sleep. After which Abraham had, uh, he told Abraham to get him a three-year-old heifer, get him a three-year-old ram, get him a three-year-old goat, a pigeon, and a turtle dove, slay them. Abraham slayed them, laid them in pieces, and the Lord came in the deep of his sleep as a fiery furnace coming through and made a covenant with Abraham in the form of a sacrifice being burned. It was an offering to God. It did, a, a covenant is an agreement between uh, two parties. But we see here in this particular example, it was a covenant that God made by himself, for himself, without Abraham taking any part in this agreement. He said, of a surety, your descendants are going to go into Egypt. They're going to be taken captive. They're going to be sojourning there for a period of 400 years. After that 400 years period is over, when the time of the Amorites are full, he said, I'm going to cause them to come out of Egypt with great substance. That was the promise. Not only was he going to give him land, but he was also going to give him a people so numerous that they could not be numbered. Abraham looked into the sky and he saw the stars in the sky. He said, as, as many as the stars as you can see, that's how I'm going to bless you, Abraham. In another instance, he caused him to look at the sand on the seashore. And he let him know, as you can count the, the sand or the petals of sand on the seashore, that's how I'm going to bless you, you and your descendants. There was a time when uh, Abram's wife, Sarah, uh, could not uh, carry this child. She was barren, and the question was to Abraham 10 years later, how are we going to have a child? And she said, well, here's my handmaid, Hagar. Take her to be your wife. Maybe the Lord would want us to have a child by him. And she took the, the woman, and she gave him to Abram for his wife. He took her in. They had a child. And when she became pregnant, she despised Sarah so much that uh, she came to Abraham and said, what should I do? She's despising me because I have no child. He said, well, she's your handmaid. You do with whatever you like. So she cast her out. Hagar went into the desert. And surprisingly, an angel appeared to her and let her know that the child that she was going to be carrying was going to be blessed and the nation was going to come out of him. But she also told Sarah what his name was going to be. She said the name of this child, before the child was born, she said the name of this child is being called Ishmael. Now, Abram, to my understanding, was not present with Hagar when the angel told Hagar what this child's name was going to be. But when you read further, 
you will see where Abraham actually called the name of that son Ishmael. God has a strange way of choosing uh, things. It's his sovereign prerogative, meaning that he has the authority to choose the time, the place, the people, the what we call the providence, the way things are going to happen, the way things don't happen. Preadventure, he can intervene. He can choose not to intervene. But he made this choice, but his choices were made audible through the angel that came to Abram and also to Hagar in the choices of these names. 400 years later, here comes Moses on the backside of Midian, being a shepherd over Jethro's flock, and then there was a burning bush. Burning bushes was no strange things in those days because we know now that wildfire starts from burning bushes. But in this particular instance, the burning bush spoke to Moses and called him by name, Moses, Moses. Unlike many of us, Moses did not run away from the bush. He ran to the bush, responded to the bush, and God let him know that he was the chosen one who was going to lead his people out of Egypt into the promised land that he has already promised Abraham 400 years earlier. So God has that sovereign choice and ability to choose certain individuals. In our lesson today, it lets us know in verse number three, he has chosen us as a body of believers. And in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, he was letting them know that God has chosen them. The word of God is not bound by time or space. We know the word of God is good. The word of God is perfect. The word of God will last forever. I believe on last week's lesson, it was taught that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So we have an assurance in the word of God. Number one, the word of God is true. And number two, the word of God is sure. So in our lesson it says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. It lets us know before we had anything, matter of fact, we didn't have anything to do with it. But in the beginning of creation, before the beginning of creation. Simply put, God had us in his mind. God was thinking about us. I believe Jeremiah 29 and 11 lets us know it this way. The thoughts that I think toward you are good and not evil to bring you to an expectation. In other words, the promises of God are our expectation. We always look forward to good things happening to us, for us, in us and through us. But he says, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That takes on a lot of explanation. How can we as sinners, we know that we have because of Adam, we were born into this world under the tutelage, under the bondage, in the slavery of sin. We recalled in the book of uh, Genesis how Adam sinned before God and death, because as a result of sin, was passed on to all men. In Romans chapter five, it lets us know, as by one man, sin entered into the earth, so death passed on to all men. But also it lets us know, also by one man, Christ Jesus hath life been given to us, which is a gift of God. It was God's prerogative to gift us, to give us all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. It had nothing to do with so much as material wealth, uh, material uh, possessions, but it had everything to do with peace, it had everything to do with joy, it has everything to do with salvation, and every benefit thereof. That's why Paul is saying, praises be to God. There's a psalm, Psalm 103, it speaks about it like this. Bless the Lord, 
O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Now that that speaks to material wealth or material things. But also in 1 John, it talks about how, beloved, I believe uh, above all things that you may as prosper, be in health, even as your soul does prosper. Everything begins with a thought. And out of the thought processes, God has blessed man to have dominion over everything that he has given us from the very beginning of creation. We were put in the garden, we were cast out of the garden, but he gave us dominion over every creature, everything that he has created, whether it be birds, trees, animals, and we have taken those things in the process of times and have made those things a convenience for us to be able to live and make a living in. But God has, above all things, given us the best gift of all, his son, Jesus Christ, whereby we have received every spiritual blessing from eternity past until eternity in the future. His word never fails. We can feel secure in his word. But he has given us this transformation process. It's called the transformation of our lives from being called out of darkness, being a sinner, saved by his grace, unmerited favor, and now we have been placed in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Further on in the chapter of the book of Ephesians, going to let us know that we were, we were under the tutelage of sin, under the slavery of sin, carried about with the dictates of the devil and demons, carried about with our flesh of the mind and our desires of our own flesh and also desires of our own mind. But God, out of his great love and mercy for us, he has delivered us from that bondage. By faith, it was grace by faith, it was grace through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. The scriptures let us know if we believe what the scripture has said, that God has loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That is a promise. Also, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God, that Jesus is God's son and that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. In other words, delivered from the slavery or bondage of sin, from the power of sin, the influence of sin, the penalty of sin, and the punishment of sin. We have already been eradicated from the death penalty. We have been eradicated from the punishment penalty. We can give God thanks and praises for that. To be released, he has given us that freedom we must stand fast in that freedom of liberty which he has given us. It's a fight. It doesn't happen all automatically. We have been set in right heavenly places with Christ. And because of that, he has given us the tools. He has given us the blessings of his Holy Spirit that will help us to make our journey in life to where we can have the ultimate victory of being with Christ in heaven. I'm precluding this with, Jesus said it this way, don't be troubled about what's going to happen in the world today. He said, if you believe in God, believe also in me. He let his disciples know on that last night before his crucifixion, he said it this way, I'm going to my father's house. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. That is a promise. Philip said, how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. 
He also said, well, show us the Father then. He said, have you not known me? When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. So he's saying, if you see me, you have seen the Father. Jesus was the personification of who God is, who God is present, who God is in the future. But in our dispensation of times, God has given him the all authority, all power in heaven and earth is in his hand. Through that process of believing in Jesus Christ, he's going to do the unthinkable. He's going to do the, what we might call the impossible, something that we cannot do on our own, and that is to be holy and blameless. But because of his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, his shed blood, it is something miraculous for every believer who trusts and believes in him, that on that day when you accept Jesus Christ, something miraculous happened. He justifies you. He wipes the slate clean. He cleanses you from all unrighteousness. It's like this. If you confess with your mouth your sins, he is just and will forgive you of your sins and also cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That is the blessing or confession of your sins. We have the forgiveness of sins. We also have the promise of eternal life. Number five and six. So having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved who is Jesus Christ. Not only have we been saved, set free, and delivered from this bondage, the slavery of sin, we have been adopted into the family of God, given full rights and privileges of being an heir of the promises that not only God has given to the children of Israel, but he also by faith in the precious promise of Jesus Christ, all the covenant promises that was entitled to Abraham was made sure in the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. When he died, he became for us a new covenant of grace, a new covenant of undeserved blessings, a new covenant of undeserved favor, where we have entered into a new realm of possibilities, a new life. He says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, old things being passed away, and behold, all things have become new. We have a new identity. We have a new relationship with God himself. We don't need a, a, a priest, or we don't have to sacrifice any blood, animal sacrifices to have an intimate relationship with God. We can speak to him 24-7 on a daily basis and have that intimate fellowship as children of God and call him our Father, which art in heaven. How, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive me my trespasses. A precursor to enter into that fellowship, a divine authority, when we can receive everything that God has for us in order for us to end journey through this life. Forgive me of my trespass, even as I forgive others who have trespassed against me. Give me this day my daily bread. It is a daily walk. It is a daily challenge. But it is all to the praise. It is under God's joy to do this, not just on our behalf, but he did it for himself. We are a prized possession given to Jesus Christ. Ultimately, we will be offered as well a prized inheritance to God through him, where we also have received special promises and privileges and inheritance from God. It is an exchange. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. It is an exchange. One who was innocent of sin became that guilt 
sacrifice for us, a substitute in our place, died the death that we should have died in order that we might become, as he is, the righteousness of God, blameless and holy in his sight. So if you choose God, Jesus Christ, today, and something preadventure should happen, and you go from your earthly labor into reward, heaven will be your home today. It is to the praise of the glory of his grace, in order that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Who can describe the riches of God's grace? He is able to supply us everything that we need according to the riches of his grace. That's why we can go boldly before his throne, uh, humbly in our time of need. He will supply everything that we need, knowing that everything that we need is in him. Uh, the scriptures let us know that we'll never be separated from the love of God. Romans 8, uh, 27 through 31st verse in your time, read it. But in short, it lets us know that there's nothing, death, famine, war, uh, any type of enemy, anything that is a thing is going to separate us from the love of God. He has made us more than conquerors through Christ who suffered for us, who died for us. But the other important thing about this is it's not a goody-goody receiving all the good things from God. We also must suffer in him. We're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations. We're going to have temptations come our way to discourage us, to distract us from this great inheritance that we have received. But in verse number eight, he says, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known the mystery according to the good pleasure which he has purposed within himself. Nothing, nobody that who has come to Jesus will in no wise be cast out. He has purchased us. He has a grip on us. He is not going to let us go. All that you have given me, they are mine, and they, are, they belong to us. But God has gone in through his, his wisdom and his knowledge, through his understanding, through his Holy Spirit that has been gifted to us as a result of Jesus going back being a propitiation for our sins, a satisfaction to God, a sacrifice that was well-pleasing to him. He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but we're going to send you another comforter. And he is going to show you all things. He's going to reveal to you all things, all things pertaining to life and godliness. And First Peter talks about how he has given us this blessing of God's divine nature to be in us, to help assist us in making decisions and being, uh, beginning with faith and adding on the excellence and uh, being, being nurtured and built up and growing up in the administration of God's word, having a hunger for the word of God, which is going to feed us. It's going to help us to mature. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We have these blessings, numeral, uh, bountiful blessings. It has abounded toward us in the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding of how we are to manage our stewardship on the earth, being a representative of God and his kingdom, being part of the body, the local body here at Grace Emmanuel. He has given us Christ as the head of the church, our pastor, what is the head and we as the body of Christ, of many members, it's like a jigsaw puzzle of a thousand pieces, each one having its own place and everybody being in their place, that when you put this puzzle together, we have a unified picture of the church in action in our neighborhood, in our world, in everything that we have to do. In verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather all together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are in earth. It is not just for those of us who live in the United States. It's not just for those who live on the north or the south side. Uh, different cultures, different nationalities, different, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or consider yourself rich or poor, uh, whether you can speak English or Hebrew or 
uh, Italian or, or whether you are living in an island in the utmost parts of the world having no idea of how to communicate, God has a way of communicating himself to each individual human being. His will is that none should perish, but all that would come into the knowledge of the truth because of Jesus Christ. He has made that available for us. It is not without responsibility. We have this responsibility. The question was asked to Jesus, how can we work this work of faith? Jesus answered it in John 6, I believe, and he says, the work of faith is to believe in me. So when we believe in Christ, it has a corresponding action that we are not left alone. We are not in this of and for ourselves, but we are here to promote the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that every man, every woman, every boy and a girl, every creature will come to this knowledge and this relationship that God so earnestly has extended his hand, his heart of love to each and every individual that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. How do we do this? We heard the word, the preaching of the gospel. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We trusted in the word that we heard and we believed. And because of the fact that we believed, we have also received our salvation. And because we received it, it says that we have been sealed. Signed, sealed for delivery. We are tokens of God's grace. We are tokens of his. We are ambassadors for Christ, representing the kingdom of God. He says, verse number 14, which is the earnest of the inheritance into the redemption of the purchased possession until the praise of his glory. There is an inheritance received of those of the one who has gone on, matter of fact, by his will. It's a testament, a document where you have received some possession of a property or some gift from someone who has gone on to glory and left it behind as an inheritance. The first word of inheritance I, I remember reading was in that Genesis 15 chapter where Abram said, I don't have an heir. Like, who am I gonna pass these things on to? You, you give, I'm an old man. Where, where, you, you promised me the, the whole world. Where's this, where's it going? I don't have an heir to give it to. He said, I'm going to provide you an heir. It's not going to pass from your descendants. It's going to be in your lineage forever. Jesus Christ himself, without going through all the genealogies you'll find in the back, I believe it's in the book of Luke, you'll see that lineage being passed down, being carried on through the mission or missionary work of the gospel of Jesus Christ being passed on to the human race throughout this world until the time when Jesus come back to receive us into himself. And those are the days that we're looking forward to where we ultimately will receive the crown of life knowing that the work that we have done, that we have fought a good fight, we have finished the course, and now we were waiting to hear from God himself Thy good and faithful servant, well done. You have been faithful over a few things. Uh, he has a crown of life, and also he has uh, this promise that he's going to give every man according to the work that he has done. And we give God the glory, we give him the praise, for all of that. You can join us each and every Sunday morning uh, at 10 a.m. And I just want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank you for uh, allowing your patience uh, as I try to explore this particular text at this particular time. Thank you. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you for this word. We thank you 
we've done the best that we could for the time that we have, Father. We thank you for this text, which explains so mightily and so, so, so great how, how great you really are. Father God, that you had us in mind even before the foundations of the world. And we just thank you for your present reality that you have, we, we have your presence with us even now. And we just thank you for the future that you have provided for us in heavenly places in your son, Jesus Christ. And for this we say amen in Jesus' name.